Tuesday, October 5th. We just hit the 12 Eastern time, and it's Eastern for me. Uh, I am Garrett Pachtinger. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Vecoral. I'm a critical care specialist. And I am, as I look outside my window in eh, kind of like dreary uh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, I want to introduce Justine. So Justine, how's it Hi, going? Everyone. Where are you? And uh, what's the weather like by you? So I'm uh, Justine. I'm an emergency critical care specialist. Also, we have a lot of DAC facts on, which is awesome. <laughs> so excited for that. I'm based out of St. Paul, Minnesota, and it is a beautiful 72 degree wow. day, sunny and gorgeous. So trying to enjoy the rest of the fall before uh, winter comes for the next six months. And we have our amazing speaker here with us today, Dr. Ann Stoneham. So Dr. Stoneham, where are you right now? I'm in sunny Pennsylvania. I'm on the opposite side of the uh, state from you right now. I'm in Pittsburgh. You're on the left coast of Pennsylvania. The left coast of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and it's beautiful here today. Gorgeous. Oh, Okay. I'm jealous of both of you. It's been rainy and dreary <laughs> just outside of Philadelphia. So as many of you do know, we love, now you know where we're logging in from around the country and around the world, so to speak, but we love hearing where you're logging in from. So if you can go, just take a few minutes, type in that little screener there. We have uh, somebody from Rio de Janeiro, Fablo, Fob I hope I pronounced that right. Tom from Tallahassee, uh, Ellen from Rhode Island, Karen from Kalamazoo, Michigan. We have Elise from Quebec, Canada. So yeah, go ahead, type in. We'd love to know where you are logging in from. It always makes us super happy because we see people not just from North America, United States, but truly all over the world. And it's fun to interact with everyone. The, the beauty of social media. I know all of us were a little bit crazy yesterday. Uh, Facebook and Instagram were down for most of the day. And I, I didn't get to see any of your beautiful pictures of your salad in portrait mode. I mean, what, what did we do all day without without Instagram photos of lunch? Um, let's see, they're coming in uh, fast and furious. Elena from California. We have Indiana. We have Kate from Florida. Leslie from Vegas. Barry from Michigan. Felicia. Hey, Felicia from Overland Park. Felicia is one of our Vet Girl team members. Oklahoma, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Connecticut, Texas, Car South Carolina. We love it. So keep going ahead and type that in. But we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we're just going to start with the general housekeeping introduction of today's presentation. And we're super excited. We're going to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to at least all of the three of our hearts and probably yours as well if you're logging on with us today. Because as, as DAC Vex, as ER peeps, we know we do say cytology all the time. And you guys probably do it as well. So we're going to be talking about how to get that cytologist in your office. I know for me, I want answers yesterday, not tomorrow, right? So if I send that sample out and it's a weekend or it's a delay and now the family, the pet owners, the pet parents are waiting, let's get that cytologist in our office. So let's get some housekeeping uh, as we move forward here. So first thing I wanted to say is a big shout out to Scopio Vet for being a great educational partner and helping to sponsor this session. It's with their support that we're able to have not only Dr. Stoneham here, but to provide this race approved continuing education completely free to you all. And I'll get into that in just a couple of minutes on how to get your CE certificate. But then again, thank you to Scopio Vet for being an amazing educational partner and helping us deliver this content today. If this is your first Vecoral webinar or you're not that familiar with Vecoral, we are the tech savvy way to get your online education. Number one, we provide CE or education for the whole team, whether it's your veterinarian team, your technician team, your CSRs, your practice management. We have content all across the board, small animal, large animal, leadership, practice management, veterinary technician focus, and the list goes on. But we provide CE in a multimedia approach as well, not just different as a specialties, but all across the board. We know some people like to watch. Here's a webinar. Some people like to listen. Podcast. Some people like to read. There's a blog and it goes on and on. So please take the opportunity. Go to vetgirlontherun.com. Check out our website and see what we can do for your team. We're excited to be part of that educational process with you. Another thing that we do is we have not only individual sessions like today, but we have carefully curated content that we put into a certificate program. And currently we have six different certificates, basic and advanced emergency medicine, medicine, nutrition, practice management, analgesia, and ophthalmology. And currently these are value adds part of your membership where if you complete our series of sessions for that certificate, we'll send you a cardstock certificate or a PDF. So make sure you take advantage of that if you are a vet girl member. And then we also have a forum. It's a great way, whether you want a, a consult from a specialist, whether you want to 
just chat with other colleagues, want to event over eventy, whether you want to post a job, also part of your Vet Girl membership. So make sure you check out our forum. Now, this is super, super important. How do you get your CE certificate for today's session? Well, the first thing, I have a little website address in blue there, tinyurl.com forward slash vet girl, and then today's date, 10 5 21. If you type that in, the other thing you can do in that big picture on the right side, we all know QR codes from COVID. Every time you go to a restaurant and want to see a menu these days, you need your QR code. So this is what it looks like on your phone. Now, I have to tell you, I updated my iPhone to iOS 15, the newest one. So what it does now is you see it recognizes that little QR code as a picture. It puts little yellow brackets around it, but then that little website comes up right underneath or in that bottom right, you see that little yellow square uh, over here or so, right? We see that going on. If you click on that, you go to it in the older iPhones, a little bar comes up on the bottom. So you just click on that and it brings you right to a form. You'll fill out that form and typically within three to five days, we will get you your CE certificate to your email inbox. But again, please make sure to either Within by, I would say, 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll cut it off half an hour after the end of the session. By 1 p.m. Eastern, please either use that website address or that QR code, and we'll get you your CE certificate. And I just put it in the chat function, too, on YouTube. So you can just click there because it only counts for CE Live. So make sure to fill that out right now before we get our learning on. And finally, as this is on YouTube, many of us know those small YouTube screens, right? In the bottom right corner, there's a little almost full square bracketed square. If you click on that, you'll get to a full screen. So it's not just in that tiny YouTube window. All right. I'm done talking. I know you're not here to listen to me. We're here to listen to Dr. Ann Stonema, critical care specialist and someone that's going to drop some knowledge for us on cytology. So Dr. Stonema, again, thank you so much for being here with us today and providing us information. I know you already said you're on the, the left coast of Pennsylvania, just near me. But if you can give a little background of, you know, I see you're in scrubs right now. What are you doing today? What do you normally do? And then please take it away. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm glad everybody's here. And I actually even saw a couple of few names that I recognize, which is really cool. Um, so as you know, I'm Dr. Ann Stonem. I um, graduated from uh, Cornell University ages ago, and then went out in general practice, even mixed animal practice, and then decided that, you know, emergency was my thing and small animal emergency. So I went back and did my internship and then did a residency at Tufts University. Um, and then I've been out in practice for a while. Uh, for a while, I was at uh, uh, VCA, VRA in Connecticut, and I trained residents, and I worked on the floor and that sort of thing. And then now I'm up at uh, practice in Pittsburgh. It's a med vet practice. And um, I am uh, basically on the floor. I train the ER doctors and um, or help them, I guess. And then uh, and then just work my butt off, as I'm sure everybody else is doing these days. Um, it's just crazy out there. And so I'm on the floor with you guys. And uh, that's really that's really everything about me. Um, so um, with uh, with this, I just want to let you all know that um, I've been using this telecytology for about four to five years. I was before that I was extremely jealous of the the human field where they can get um, result, cytologic diagnoses in their hospital rather rapidly. And I was really, really thrilled to discover once I got to this hospital that there are companies out there that were letting us do it as well. I use Scopio, which is the, that's the company that we started with when they were in their infancy, um, or maybe I shouldn't say infancy, but we helped them uh, perfect their, their platforms and, and the methods, and we've been through a lot of different changes with them. Um, but I've also seen that this is available through the major veterinary labs, Antec, IDEX, HESCA. So got those. Um, first off, I am not being paid by any company to give this lecture, and I have no financial obligations. Today, I am going to be introducing you guys to telecytology if you already haven't used it yourself. Uh, and I'll walk you through how I experience it. And then we'll talk about um, some of the, the uh, benefits, limitations. I'll show you some examples because there's some, it's really amazingly detailed pictures that we see. Okay, Garrett, next slide. 
Um, first, I guess I really, I'm really interested in knowing, um, have you guys ever heard of telecytology before today's lecture? If everybody could just kind of the yes or no, have you, I don't know if any, if we can do that. I'm not sure, Garrett, can we? I thought we could. Yeah, um, can go ahead and mention in the comment section. Okay. Um, we have a couple to, of, to just, couple just of give yeses. the answers in the comment section. Yeah. Okay, a great, yeses, thank you. That right? one seems to be pretty busy, okay. but a lot of yeses. So yeah. I'll let you know a lot of yeses going on right now. Okay, so you've heard of it, great. And do you do you guys all, and then, you know, are you interested in having it in your practice? I kind of presume yes, um, based on the fact that there are a lot of you here. Um, so those yeses uh, coming in as well. Yeah. Yep, a lot yes, of people yes, interested yes, in yes, yes. heard of it. And okay. A lot of people, a lot, a lot of yeses coming in for sure. They want to have it in their practice. Absolutely. Okay, I should not. I should not have put two questions there. I apologize. Okay, next slide. So um, first off, we'll just get into showing you an example so you guys can see how amazing this is. This is a very, very common example um, of a case, uh, or a, an example of a very common type of case that we see in practice. And this is Sadie. As you see, she's a three-year-old female spade beagle mix, super, super cute. And her main complaint or complaints were that she was lethargic, she had a poor appetite, she had increased urination um, at home, and she was incontinent in the house. And on physical exam, we found that she had enlarged firm, enlarged firm prescap lymph nodes, and she was markedly hypercalcemic. Her total calcium was 15, and her um, ionized calcium was 2.5, so really high. Um, and then this is the beautiful picture that we, we were um, shown on, uh, on the screens and Scopio. So I just pulled these pictures directly off of the, um, the website of, of her case. So um, as you can see, um, and I will, I will kind of read the, the report that we got so you get an idea of the detail of the report that we have. It's a pretty standard report. So the um, cytologist described this as a lymphoid population, which primarily consists of inter intermediate to large lymphocytes. The nuclei are 1 to 1.5 times the size of a neutrophil. Um, there's an expanded amount of basophilic cytoplasm. Uh, the nuclei are occasionally indented with fine chromatin, have multiple nucleoli, and there are mitotic figures frequently observed. So um, you can see the beautiful mitotic figures in that, in that picture on the right side. Um, and the diagnosis is lymphoma. And with Miss Sadie, because of that hypercalcemia, we're looking at a patient that probably has T-cell lymphoma. So she did go home. Unfortunately, owners didn't want to continue with any treatment. So she went home on prednisone alone. And unfortunately, she was lost to follow up. But that's one example. Next slide. Um, so the, when I first started using this in my practice, the thing I'm most interested in is, is this accurate? Is this going to give me as good a, an answer as a cytologist looking at the slide directly under a microscope? So we have we had very few uh, studies in the veterinary literature, but the ones that I found basically said, number one, there is significant agreement between light and digital microscopy, as long as you're using an experienced cytologist. So basically have boarded cytologists reading your, your scans. Um, and then uh, there's a 98% agreement between light microscopy, microscopy and digital microscopy, microscopy, sorry, for neoplastic lesions. That was an N of 40, 40. And then in that same study, if you added in the other samples of uh, like normal, inflammatory, infectious, it dropped a little bit, but only to 92%. So still 92% agreement between both. And then there was a final study which basically said for cutaneous t tumors, and there were quite a few of them, although I don't remember the number, uh, digital microscopy was non-inferior to light microscopy. And that is a quote. So my guess is it was pretty darn good. So what are we going to use it for? We're using it for all of the uh, usual suspects. Um, we're going to look at uh, tumors, masses, and large lymph nodes, nodules seen on ultrasound or with the naked eye, effusions, cystic fluid samples, blood smears, bone marrow. And then next, 
is another example. This is my, my beautiful friend, Frecky. He's a one-year-old male neuter uh, Maine Coon. He presented for an acute onset of labor breathing, lethargy, anorexia. We found that he didn't have breath sounds on one side. We looked with the, with the x-ray and with the ultrasound, and sure enough, he has fluid on one side. So if I see fluid in a ma young Maine Coon, my usual thought is going to be, well, this is probably heart failure, but that's not usually unilateral. So we got a sample. And next, sam next slide. Here is the sample. It's a, these gorgeous, beautiful neutrophils that are chowing down on bacteria. He had a pyothorax. So of course, this is, a, this is an example of something that we can easily diagnose in our hospitals. Um, but I did want to show you an example of just another, uh, another type of, of sample we can see beside neoplastic. So this is our infectious one. Um, and this guy ended up ultimately doing well after having chest tubes and then having to go to surgery to have uh, an abscessed lung lobe removed. Um, he did well. All right, next slide. Here's another example of a different, another use of telecytology, which is the blood smear. And this is Jester. Jester's, Jester is a 10-year-old male neuter dachshund. He came in for bleeding gums, vomiting, anorexia. And physical exam was not too exciting, but um, on his blood work, he was anemic. His PCV was about 10%. His white cell count was about 30%. He had neutrophilia and monocytosis, but he also had lymphocytosis. So we have to step back and say, okay, is he having an anemia secondary to cancer or is he having an anemia j just because of primary IMHA? Do, you know, what's going on here? So we did a blood smear. Next slide. And this blood smear, they told us that there were many nucleated red cells, which skewed our uh, differential. When the manual differential was performed by the cytologist, it actually showed only a 5% lymphocytosis, or sorry, 5% lymphocytes, which is not a lymphocytosis. So they thought, um, based on the fact that there were a large number of neutrophils, there were some metamyelocytes, some myelocytes, there was a neutrophilia with a left shift. They thought that this is probably going to be immune mediated thrombocytopenia and anemia. Now, the only reason they said there was anemia is because on the slide, they were worried that the, the grouping of the red cells was more like um, uh, agglutination, um, but they didn't really, they said this could also just be anemia because of massive bleeding from thrombocytopenia. Now his platelet count was zero according to everything we got. So um, with this, he was, he, was a, he was treated for IMTP, and he did, um, he did very well, actually, long term. Next slide. Um, so why choose telecytology over the historical method, which is sending slides to the lab and waiting for the results? Well, we can reel off benefits pretty easily. Um, there's faster turnaround time, so we can help our patients, and we can help owners make decisions more quickly. Um, so better medicine, happier clients, and happier clients is real important these days. In a critical situation such as sepsis or fulminating neoplasia, when patients really can't wait to start treatments, we can um, we can start them quickly. You know, having a diagnosis allows me to treat with the right medicine rather than doing giving educated guesses. And the turnaround time with this really it's about an hour after I after I submit the sample or after my techs submit the sample, it's about an hour and I get a full report and I do not need to request a stat read to get that. Um, let's see, the communications are important. If we could um, go back one, I'm sorry, Garrett. Um, the communications portion is important because uh, I can communicate with the, um, the technician at, at the company who tells me if the scan isn't good or if the sample is no good. So we can either rescan or we can um, uh, get a new sample if that patient still is in the hospital. Next slide. Okay, so how do we do this? The method's pretty simple. We stain the slides as normal. We just use DiffQuick. Um, if I can get enough slides, I'm going to keep some unstained in case there's a need for additional diagnostics, such as flow or special stains of some sort, or if I'm clumsy and I break one. I try to review the slides before sending them because I can find out if 
one, they're worthwhile to send, and two, to determine the best area of the slide, because because we can focus on a region of interest on the slide um, quite easily with the machines. And the machine that's up there is the machine that we put the slides into. Um, uh, we're going to apply immersion oil and then a cover slip, and then we use EasyVet for our for our electronic medical record. So we just enter the medical information into that. Um, and then we put the slides into the slide scanner. Like I said, it's pictured right there. And this machine takes about three slides at a time. Um, like I said, we can choose the region of interest if we want. And up until this point, this total tech time is about five minutes. And then scanning the slides takes 10 to 12 minutes. Um, that's for three slides. The doctor is notified by text about the progress of, of the scan. The slide is uploaded. The slide is being reviewed by the pathologist. And finally, the report's been finalized and we can go ahead and read it. The report is dropped into our, our EMR automatically. And uh, like I said, that's within one hour of, of submitting those scans. Next slide. Um, this is what my computer screen looks like once I click on the patient name in the results list. Uh, on the website. I can go to patient info, which you can see there on the top. I can go to the scans, so to, uh, to look at the scans or the reports. And now the picture there is a picture of, a, of the scan. Um, I just pulled it right off of my computer screen. Um, along the top, there are a few little buttons. Um, the buttons are either um, to uh, apologize. I need to just, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. I have a button that gives me full screen. Um, on the top uh, right-hand side, there's a picture of the entire screen, of the entire slide, rather. And on that slide, it's really hard to see, but there's a little red box. And the red box shows me where on the slide I'm getting this picture from. Um, and then on the lower left-hand side, there's that gives us how um, uh, I, my, what, what my magnification is. I apologize. I'm having trouble keeping up with my mind here. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, that little red box that's on the big, the regular slide. I can move that around so that I um, can make put a new picture on there fairly easily, just with a mouse, a clicked mouse. Okay, next slide. Here's the report that's generated and attaches to the EasyVet record. It's a standard cytology report. So it has the microscopic description, the interpretation in the comments. And that's it for that one. Next slide. So the communication I touched on already, you know, the technician might be getting to me to let me know that the scan's not good or there's a problem with the scan. We just have to redo it. Um, that's pretty rare. Um, sometimes they're telling me that there's really nothing there and we need to go get another sample. But I also get texts from the cytologist sometimes. They ask for additional information that can help them make a decision. So they might be asking for physical exam findings or historical information about the patient. Um, and then the text also, and then I chat, I can chat back and forth with the, uh, with the pathologist if I want to, or if we need to. Um, and then we can access the report as soon as it's finalized because they let us know by text. Next slide. Um, the limitations from what I've experienced are the same that you get with light microscopy. So if it's a cell pore sample, um, if it's an effusion, especially a cell pore effusion, it's better. I usually submit both an, a, a, a slide of it as is and a slide of the sedimented effusion. Um, we also run the effusion through our CBC machine. I don't know if you can do that with all CBC machines, but, um, we put that through the CBC machine so we get a readout of what cell what cell types are in there and the percentage, and then we also get, put a total solids in there. And then I can attach that to the record um, that we're submitting for them to evaluate. So they have that. Um, for uh, blood smears, we can submit a CBC report so that they have, excuse me, they have that and they can review that to help them make in, in decisions. Next slide, since we're running out of time here. This is Bella. She's a, just more examples, 12 year old female spig golden. She presented because she had a cyst on her right front leg. It was previously evaluated and was cystic at that point, just a cyst. Um, she has a chronic limp and now she's not eating. So I don't know if you can appreciate the size of that. I kind of put the circle around it. 
but it's about five times the size of her actual leg and it's surrounding the lateral, medial, and posterior aspects of the elbow and distal humerus. The ultrasound shows that it's partially cystic and partially soft tissue. So we went ahead and got a sample of the soft tissue. Now I'm not gonna read through the report, but next slide gives us that. Um, this is the picture that we get off of, uh, off of Scopio and you can see some really nasty looking cells. Unfortunately, this ended up being a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and that was their diagnosis. The owners opted not to proceed with any further treatment, took her home on pain medication. Next slide. Okay, this is Rascal. Rascal's a 17 year old male neutered Havanese. He came with unilateral epistaxis that had been going on off and on for a month. Um, and then he was getting intermittently confused as well. So it seems like, you know, from my physical exam, there's up something up there in the nose. So we did a CT and we found aggressive contrast enhancing mass in his right nasal cavity and he has diffuse lymphadenopathy. So we aspirated lymph nodes and next slide. Poor rascal has some nasty looking, very large lymphocytes um, with eccentric, uh, eccentrically placed uh, chromatin, um, some nasty nucleoli. So unfortunately, our boy Rascal also has uh, lymphoma and in the nose. So we know this now. We don't have to send this guy for, we know it right away. We can decide whether or not we want to do chemo. Not one that we need to send for RT. And then uh, my final example is Spotty. She was a frequent flyer here. 13-year-old um, female spade lab. She was anorexic. They, you know, just not doing right. She had hepatosplenomegaly. She had a little bit of azotemia, mildly elevated liver enzymes, and a non-regenerative anemia, thrombocytopenia, and proteinuria. We did salt cytology of her spleen and liver. Next slide. And she ended up having a plasma cell tumor, which was diagnosed by uh, by uh, the telecytology. And so we get all these results real quick. So next slide. So finally, you know, just to sum up, telecytology provides timely test results quite more, quite rapid as opposed to our 24 to 48 hour turnaround time with light microscopy. This improves our patient care and it's equal to light microscopy as far as we can all tell. So this picture is my daughter on bring your daughter to work day. She was doing surgery on a, a stuffed animal and was thrilled to find that she had a chocolate kiss in there. Any questions? All right, give me one second. Let me bring everyone back into the mix. We will take off our solo and there we are, we are all back. <laughs> awesome information. I think, uh, you know, very, very quickly, I would say, um, you know, my takeaway, obviously, is we understand how important cytology is in clinical practice. I think the three of us would agree when someone comes into the ER, right? We want answers as uh, type A criticalists and ER people. We want answers yesterday. No. Yeah. yeah. Now, yesterday, not tomorrow. They, they want answers. <laughs> and it really does help us guide a clinical conversation better, right? I would certainly love to have the answers now so I can sit down with the family face to face. Those conversations tend to be a little bit more challenging over the phone later. You can't, uh, you know, if I, if I know it's lymphoma and I can sit them down in a room, I can sense their body language. I can see how they're um, acknowledging my conversation. Are they making eye contact? Are they crying? Are they shuddering? Are they closing up on me? Over the phone, you can't get that. And I think this certainly in a very, very quick period of time gets us the information we need to help families make an informed decision, have better client communication. So ultimately, absolutely, a lot of a lot of great information. Now, I do want to get to, if you have questions, please go ahead and type them and we'll get to as many as we can. I did want to just quickly wrap up our presentation as well. Again, as we talked about at the beginning of the session, firstly, I again wanted to thank Scopio Vet for being an amazing educational partner. So with their support, they were able to get Dr. Stoneham here, talk about cytology and get a completely free complimentary race approved educational event. Hopefully uh, during a lunch hour, while you're having a moment to either quickly get a couple of wheat thins or a granola bar in your mouth between your you know, 87 cases per day, but in all seriousness, thank you. We're, we're honored and humbled that you're able to be here. So thank you to Scopio. 
for being a great educational partner. Reminder, I'll keep this open for another 30 minutes. So one o'clock Eastern, this will close, but this is how, please, please pay attention. This is how to get your race approved CE. Firstly, you can take a picture using the QR code on your phone. If you take a picture of the QR code, many of us are now familiar because all restaurants do this as more paper menus because of COVID. So QR codes are back in style. Use that QR code or that in blue, that tiny I dropped it in the link. Yeah. And Justine put it in the YouTube chat as well, but that tiny URL forward slash vet girl. And then today's date, 10, 5, 21, or again, Justine put a longer link in the chat. Use one of those. Please fill out the form within three to five days at most. We will verify attendance and send you your CE certificate. But let's go ahead. If you have questions, we would love to love to hear them. Um, I know I saw one of them. Dr. Stenham, I don't know if you know from your experience. I know it's not technically a medical question, but um, the, the pictures look great on the presentation. But do you know, happen to know if it's okay, if not, how large the file sizes are of the photos that they're you know, scanning and downloading? I mean, a typical photo for me these days, even with an iPhone, can be five to eight megabytes. You know, back in the mm -hmm. day, when we didn't have such high quality photos, we were in the, you know, less than a one megabyte and the pixelation was poor. These look fantastic. So I assume it's there's got to be something at least in there. Do you happen to know? Nope. Yeah. Nope. It's okay. I'm, I'm, I think, I'm highly non-technical. I just use the technical. No worries. No worries. I mean, I think but even, even importing into a presentation, you could see how high quality those photos were. Obviously, when we're making clinical and medical decisions, it's important to get a great um, great tool. I think uh, one of the members of Scopio may be behind the scenes in the chat. So mm -hmm. I, think I think Anthony I saw somebody in there. there, yeah. So Anthony, if you can type in just the file size, I'm interested because I'm a techie, uh, a techie person. Um, this is a, a question maybe for Anne as well. Um, you know, when I were to set, when I was to send, uh, or were to send cytology out to the lab, I, I kind of know we're in that usually, you know, not including the aspirate or whatever you charge for that, but the cytology itself can be 150. It can be 200 per site. Do you know approximately on average what your practice does? And remembering for everyone out there that different practices may mark things up differently, but on mm -hmm. average, yeah. how much does it cost your your clinic to run a cytology? How much it costs my clinic to yeah. run it? Well, sorry, what, what do you charge? How much do I charge? Do I, how much do we yeah. charge the client? We we basically charge. We end up charging this pretty much the same that as it would cost to send it to IDEX. I haven't okay. seen a difference in there, but the only different, the one difference is that I've seen, and Scopio may need to correct me, but um, usually with one patient, we can send in multiple. If you send in multiple um, different organs it ends up costing less than if you send multiple organs into the main the main lab for light microscopy. Awesome. I, I know way, the way it's priced out here. Yeah, I know it's always that had that clinical dilemma of, you know, you have a patient, let's say you're ultrasounding and you yeah. get mesenteric lymph node, you get spleen, you get yes. liver, and you're like, well, I think the lymph node Which will probably one do be I the send? answer. And do I really want to send the spleen and the liver too? And then of course, you know, as luck would have it, you know, you send it out. 24, 48 hours goes by, and then you get a non-diagnostic yeah. result. And now you have to yeah. take the time to send out yeah. your liver or your spleen. And we all know yeah. that we, um, we don't love the 48-hour conversation of a non-diagnostic sample. That's a challenging conversation for us to, to clinically have. I don't know yeah. if you have this experience. And I, 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 um, if it is a non-diagnostic sample, are you free to send other uh, – free is not a better word. Are you able to send other slides out to yes. correct that? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, obviously, again, we all yeah. hate the uh, we all hate the non-diagnostic oh, yeah. table. To me, I would dread the report again a day and a half, two days later. We know the owners are sitting by their cell phones waiting for you to call them, and you have to explain what a non-diagnostic sample is and why we need to, they have to come back into the hospital and may need to get other aspirates or do something else. So this certainly, I, I don't know that it takes the takes out a non-diagnostic sample from a conversation, but it certainly gives you the information faster to make that mm -hmm. clinical condition, clinical decision better for an hour out. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, you're still here. Great. Let me just get a couple extra. Let me just get another sample. Let me get another yeah. sample. And then they hopefully go home with the result. And I will also yeah. jump in since we have three criticalists here. I often feel that one of the top referrals that I get is the chronically elevated liver enzyme patient. And mm -hmm. I hate to break it to you, but I get really frustrated when referring vets 
uh, submit these or refer these in without prepping the owner uh, for more than the ultrasound. The ultrasound often looks normal, <laughs> uh, even with increased liver enzymes, and you really need to get a piece of tissue. So you need to prepare the owner for aspirates uh, to rule out underlying disease. And my general rule is starting with an aspirate, and if we don't get an answer on aspirate, progressing and warning the owner your dog needs to be sedated or your cat needs to be sedated so we can get a biopsy. Um, so really yeah. important that you discuss these with the owners. I'm a huge um, advocate of aspirating because it gives us mm -hmm. an answer. I know Garrett is too, but you know, don't forget those three things to tell the owner, getting that coag first to make sure they're not coagulopathic, but talking to the owner about uh, rare risk of severe bleeding. That second thing would be cancer could be here and be aspirated two millimeters over. So we might not get an answer. And then the third thing is really uh, the rare, rare risk of a non-diagnostic sample. And, you know, I always tell people, especially while you're in vet tech school or veterinary school, to perfect your smears, because depending on how your radiologist is aspirating um, and how you're smearing them out, that's going to improve your diagnostic yield. So, so helpful. Make sure, again, those three things, warning the owners of um, you know, potential severe internal bleeding or bleeding from the site, uh, which is totally treatable. Like I always just check a PCV total solids one or two hours later uh, yes. or examine the patient and look at their color. Um, getting a non-diagnostic non sample or very rarely aspirating, you know, a couple of millimeters over and missing that disease. So when in doubt, aspirate more. <laughs> I, I always joke, going along with Justine said, you know, while some radiologists are really good based on their experience about putting differentials in the appropriate order, they don't have a histoprobe, right? That's my joke or my comment. They don't have a histoprobe. They're going to give you a description of the organ. Let's just say a hyperechoic hepatomegaly, like Justine was talking about, or, you know, hypoechoic liver chain. But it's not an answer. It's just a description of the, of the color the size, the, sh the appearance, the shape, right? And then based on that, there are differentials. But just as Justine said, then we need to take the next step. You can't look at it with your eyes, so to speak. It's not a histoprobe. You need to get more information. And so Justine hit the nail right on the head with that conversation is that we have to prepare them for the next step or steps. Yes, ultrasound tells us, you know, is it diffuse? Is it liver, spleen, lymph nodes? And we're like, okay, you know, good things don't happen all over the abdomen type of thing, right? You don't, you don't see nodules all over every organ and say it's probably benign. It gives you an inkling, an int, but you got to go after it, right? I'm going to go back. I, I see that one person asks for the CE. There we go. Okay. So, yeah. So, remember, that's the URL, the tinyurl.com forward slash Vecro 10521. And Justine, thankfully, put that link in the chat, as well as please use the QR code. Most of us are now uh, very QR code centric with restaurants, bars, and pretty much everything else. Uh, post-COVID in a sense of, of how to get directions to anything. So please use that QR code. If you have other questions, please go ahead and type them into the question screener. We do want to get to as many questions as possible, but I'll be also be respectful of your time. And uh, I should also say again, thank you for all, all of you for letting us know where you're logging in from. It's cool. I, I, I can't it's really cool. Forward. It's cool to see people truly from around the world logging into the session. So We'll stay online for another minute or two as we hit about the 1240 Eastern time. Um, like I said, we'll get your email and email to you within three to five days at most with the link to download, print, and fill out your CE certificate. So don't uh, stress if it is not uh, today or tomorrow. Let's see here. Oh, question on um, starting an ear cytology trial. Um, do you know if uh, anything's going on with a potential ear cytology trial? And I would say that's super helpful because right now, <laughs> if I have an otitis case, I, I know as a criticalist, like to smear out L and R, yeah. but I don't have time to look at that cytology. So that'd be really helpful. And then um, do you know Ballpark or maybe um, Scopio, the sponsor could weigh into in the chat function on costs? Um, I'm also going to redirect people to the website, uh, to their website for more information too. And I know there was also one other link that um, I'm going to drop in there and it's just in the chat function. And it's just, um, if you're looking for more cases of the week, just to uh, brush up on your cytology, I will put that in the, uh, the chat function down there. So definitely check that out too. All right, I think we'll get to some more answers in chat later on. But again, I, as I said before, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And I'm sure if it's, you know, 
West Coast and it's 9, 9.40 a.m. or East Coast where I am, it's your your moment of silence between cases. We want to give you a couple of minutes. So I do want to thank, again, Dr. Stoneham for being here with us today. I wanted to thank uh, Scopio Vet, as I said earlier, for being an amazing educational partner and providing this complimentary to the veterinary world. And I wanted to thank you all for taking the opportunity to spend about a half an hour with us. We're honored and humbled that you've taken the time to do that. If you have any questions, mm -hmm. please use that help center on the Vetgirl website. You contact us. We will get back to you pretty darn quickly. Uh, again, thank you for being here, and we hope to see you online at our next Vetgirl event. Have a great day, great night, great morning.